New York has seen many harsh winters, but this snowfall is unlike anything that came before. At first glance, it looks like a familiar snowstorm. Roads buried, cars stuck, the city brought to a standstill. But the truth is, the snow covering New York this time did not come from a storm. And because of that, it does not end the way people expect. When snow does not arrive and leave as a single event, its consequences do not disappear once the streets are cleared. For millions of people living in and relying on this region's water systems, the real concern is not the snow sitting on the pavement, but what remains after it melts. Things that never show up in weather forecasts and do not fade away when winter passes. In this video, we look at those quiet consequences and why so few people saw them coming. Let's take a closer look. It looks like a typical snowstorm, but the snow burying New York this time did not come from a storm, and that is the key issue. Recent footage shows large areas of New York covered by deep snow. Streets disappear under white drifts, vehicles come to a halt, and daily life is disrupted. To many people, it feels like just another brutal winter, similar to what the city has endured in the past. But a closer look reveals an important difference. This event was not created by a traditional winter storm. For decades, most major snowfalls in New York were driven by large-scale weather systems commonly called winter storms. These systems form far away, follow clear paths, and bring snow, rain, and strong winds across wide regions. They tend to follow a familiar pattern. They arrive, reach a peak, then move on. After that comes cleanup and recovery. The snow causing serious impacts recently formed in a different way. This phenomenon is known as lake effect snow. From a scientific standpoint, lake effect snow does not require a major storm. It forms when cold air from the north moves across the surface of large lakes, such as Lake Erie or Lake Ontario, while those lakes are not fully frozen. As the cold air passes over warmer water, it absorbs heat and moisture. That air mass then moves inland where the moisture quickly condenses and falls as snow. The critical point is that this process can continue as long as the underlying conditions remain in place. The result is not a blanket of snow spread evenly across the region, but narrow, intense bands of snowfall concentrated in specific areas. Meanwhile, places only a few dozen miles away may see little or no snow at all. There are three features that make lake effect snow fundamentally different from a typical snowstorm. First is uneven distribution. Snow totals can vary dramatically over short distances, making forecasting and resource planning far more difficult. Second is repetition. If the lakes remain unfrozen, wind direction stays consistent and cold air continues to arrive, the same area can be hit again and again, even before previous snowfall has been cleared. Third is duration. Lake effect snow does not necessarily end quickly. It can persist for several days in a row without the arrival of a new storm system. Together, these three factors turn recent snowfall from a short-term event into sustained pressure on infrastructure and daily life. From a scientific perspective, it is important to understand that lake effect snow does not pass through an area in the usual sense. It remains as long as physical conditions allow it to keep forming. In other words, Snow is not falling simply because local weather is bad, but because a larger chain of conditions continues to operate. This matters greatly for a city like New York, where winter response systems were designed around the assumption that snow arrives in distinct waves, followed by a gradual easing of pressure. Lake effect snow creates a different challenge. It does not deliver one single shock. Instead, it applies constant, repeated, and uneven strain. This is the kind of pressure that only becomes clear after systems have been forced to operate continuously for days without a real break. So to truly understand what has been happening in New York recently, the first question is not how much snow has fallen. The more important question is how this snow was formed and why it can keep returning to the same areas. To answer that, we have to look beyond snow-covered streets in New York and turn our attention to the Great Lakes hundreds of miles away. When we step away from New York's snow-covered streets and look northwest, the root cause of this pattern becomes much clearer. Lake effect snow cannot exist without one central factor. The large lakes must remain at least partially unfrozen during winter. From a physical standpoint, open water acts as a source of both energy and moisture. As cold air moves across warmer lake surfaces, 
heat transfer and evaporation begin almost immediately. The more exposed water there is, the more moisture the air can absorb, and the greater the potential for snow formation. For many decades, this process was naturally limited by one key factor, ice. When the Great Lakes froze early and maintained stable ice cover through winter, evaporation largely shut down, and lake effect snow weakened on its own. Recent observations, however, point to a different trend taking shape. Large lakes such as Lake Erie and Lake Ontario are freezing later than their historical averages, and in many winters, ice never fully covers their surfaces during the coldest months. This leads to a direct consequence. The window for lake effect snow becomes longer. Instead of occurring only during a short period early in winter, the phenomenon can reappear again and again, as long as three conditions exist at the same time. First, there is still open water on the lakes. Second, cold air continues to move south from the north. Third, wind direction remains relatively steady over several days. Remove just one of these factors, and lake effect snow weakens. But when all three persist, snow can continue forming without any major storm system passing through the area. From a scientific perspective, this is critical. Lake effect snow depends less on moving weather systems and more on the background state of the environment. It behaves like a reaction that activates on its own when conditions are right, rather than waiting for an outside trigger. As lake freeze-up continues to shorten, both the frequency and duration of lake effect snow are likely to increase. This conclusion is not based on a single event, but on the physical relationship between water temperature, open lake surface area, and evaporation. What matters is that the change does not need to be dramatic to have serious effects. A shift of just a few weeks in freeze timing can significantly extend the period when lake effect snow remains active. For a city like New York, the impact is not simply that winter feels harsher. The real change lies in the type of pressure the system now faces. Instead of one or two clear peaks, stress becomes spread out, repetitive, and harder to anticipate. Another important factor is wind stability. When atmospheric patterns lock wind direction in place for several days, the same downwind areas can receive snowfall continuously, while other areas remain largely untouched. This makes forecasting and resource distribution far less effective if planners rely on older models. Taken together, these background conditions are reshaping how lake effect snow influences the Northeast. This is not the story of a single storm. It is the story of a changing physical context in which winter weather now operates. And within that new context, technical assumptions that once made sense are beginning to show their limits. When baseline conditions shift, the next question is no longer about the weather itself. It becomes a question of what assumptions our urban systems were built on and whether those assumptions still hold. When winter's baseline conditions change, the first impact is not the amount of snow, but how cities respond to it. To understand why lake effect snow creates more strain than expected, we have to look at how New York has managed snow for decades. Historically, most major snow events the city faced were tied to clearly defined weather systems. A storm would form, move in, intensify, then move out. The entire winter response process, from deploying plows and spreading salt to managing traffic and staffing, was organized around the familiar rhythm. Snow arrives, resources are concentrated. When snowfall stops, pressure gradually eases. Cleanup follows, recovery begins, and preparations resume for the next event. This model works well when snow has a clear beginning and a clear end. Lake effect snow does not follow that pattern. With this type of snowfall, there is no single, easily defined peak. Snow may intensify, weaken, then return without a new storm forming or passing through the region. For urban systems, this makes it difficult to know when pressure has truly passed. More importantly, there is almost no true break between snow events. As long as background conditions persist, the same areas can receive snow day after day. Old accumulation has not been cleared before new snow arrives. Crews and equipment must operate continuously, even though they were designed to function in shifts and cycles. This fundamentally changes how risk is managed. In the traditional model, once roads are cleared and treated, danger is expected to decrease until the next storm. With lake effect snow, that temporary sense of safety does not exist. A road that is clear in the morning can become hazardous again just hours later. Add to this the uneven geographic distribution. Lake effect snow does not blanket the entire city. It concentrates intensely in certain areas, 
while others see little impact. This makes citywide resource allocation inefficient. One district may remain overwhelmed for days, while resources elsewhere sit underused. From a technical standpoint, this does not mean the system is failing. It is doing exactly what it was designed to do. The problem is that operating conditions have changed, while organizational structures and response strategies are still rooted in older assumptions. This mismatch does not cause immediate collapse. Instead, it creates accumulating strain. Each return of snow consumes more fuel, labor, and materials, while opportunities to regain stability grow fewer. When a system cannot wait for natural melting, cannot wait for weather to pass, and cannot rely on a clear recovery window, the most practical response is to turn toward measures that produce immediate results. And that is where a familiar chemical solution begins to take center stage. When urban systems face snowfall that is repetitive, uneven, and prolonged, the next response is no longer about organization or manpower. It comes down to the tool that delivers results the fastest. In that context, salt becomes the central choice. From a chemical standpoint, sodium chloride works in a straightforward way. When it dissolves in water, it lowers the freezing point of the mixture, making ice harder to form and helping existing ice melt more quickly. This mechanism has been well understood and used for decades. For road management, the advantages of salt are clear. It acts quickly, can be deployed across large areas, and can be used repeatedly without changing equipment or complex procedures. In urgent conditions, salt allows travel to be restored in the shortest possible time. Lake effect snow makes those advantages especially important. When snow returns to the same area multiple times in a single day or over several consecutive days, waiting for natural melting is no longer realistic. Temperatures tend to stay low, sunlight is weak, and new snow quickly covers what was just cleared. Under those conditions, mechanical plowing alone is not enough to keep roads safe for long. In this situation, salt is not the ideal solution in every respect, but it is the solution that can be applied immediately, regardless of whether snow continues to fall. When traffic flow, emergency response, and goods transport cannot tolerate delays, this becomes the practical choice. Another reason salt use increases during lake effect events is the difficulty of precise prediction. When snow does not fall evenly and can return at any time, agencies tend to act preventively rather than wait until roads become hazardous. This leads to more frequent salt application, even during periods when snowfall briefly weakens. In short-term operational logic, this decision makes sense. The system has few alternatives to guarantee immediate safety. Each return of snow without timely treatment increases the risk of accidents, emergency service disruptions, and supply chain delays. However, this is where a fundamental difference begins to emerge between short-term effectiveness and long-term consequences. Operationally, salt does its job on the road surface. But physically and chemically, salt does not disappear when that job is done. It simply moves from a solid form into a dissolved one and from the road into drainage systems. At this stage, the problem is not yet obvious. There are no immediate signs of damage or failure. That is why salt use continues, repeated as a normal part of winter operations. But when lake effect snow makes this cycle more frequent and longer lasting, the amount of salt used accumulates season by season, year after year. That is when the story begins to move away from the road itself and into systems that receive far less attention. From that point on, the question is no longer whether salt works. The question becomes where it actually goes after it leaves the road and what happens next. When snow melts and roads look dry again, the problem appears to be over. But at the physical and chemical level, the most important process is only beginning. Salt does not vanish after serving its purpose. Once dissolved, sodium chloride separates into sodium and chloride ions, which then travel with meltwater into storm drains, streams, rivers, and eventually lakes and downstream watersheds. The critical element here is chloride. Unlike many other pollutants, Chloride does not break down biologically. Once it enters a water system, it can only be diluted or accumulate over time. It does not simply disappear. In winters with relatively low salt use, natural systems can absorb the resulting chloride without obvious change. But when salt is applied more frequently and for longer periods, as during lake effect snow events, 
baseline chloride levels begin to rise season after season. Long-term monitoring shows that chloride concentrations in many freshwater watersheds trend upward over time. These changes are often too small to cause immediate impact, but they are cumulative. Chloride from one winter is still present when the next winter begins. For freshwater ecosystems, this matters. Many aquatic species have a low tolerance for salinity, and even small shifts in ion concentration can alter population structures over time. For infrastructure and daily life, chloride accumulation also carries long-term costs. Water treatment systems must work harder to maintain drinking water quality. In areas that rely on wells, these changes can directly affect the water people depend on every day. What stands out is that these consequences do not appear at the same time as snowfall. They do not arrive with images of slick roads or stalled traffic. Instead, they surface gradually over years, in the form of rising costs and subtle changes that are difficult to sense without measurement. At that point, the story of snow and salt is no longer about a single winter. It becomes a story of long-term accumulation. Once these changes cease to be isolated effects, the final question is how much accumulation the current system can tolerate before it is forced to change. Looking back across the entire chain, from how snow forms to how chloride builds up in freshwater, it becomes clear that this is not the story of a single event. The issue lies in the limits of an operating model that was built around winter conditions that were once more stable. Lake effect snow does not alter the laws of physics. Cold air behaves the same way, and the Great Lakes still supply moisture as they always have. What has changed is how long and how often those conditions exist together. As lakes freeze later, the window for lake effect snow grows longer, and the pressure placed on urban systems becomes more continuous. Most winter response systems were designed to handle short bursts of stress with clear starting and ending points. When pressure becomes extended and repetitive, the model does not fail instantly, but its resilience erodes over time. Salt illustrates this logic clearly. On the road, it solves immediate safety concerns. At the system level, Repeated use over many seasons creates a slow accumulation process that affects freshwater, ecosystems, and treatment costs. There is no single moment that marks this shift. It unfolds gradually over many years. This is what makes the risk difficult to recognize. It does not show up as a dramatic failure or a visible crisis. It appears as a long-term trend. Safety thresholds that once seemed sufficient begin to move while systems continue to operate under older assumptions. So the final question is not whether New York can handle one particular snow event. The question is how long the current model remains suitable as baseline conditions continue to drift away from what it was designed to manage. As future winters arrive, this question will not fade. It will only become clearer until a different approach better aligned with the new reality takes its place. Thanks a lot for sticking with us till the very end. If you found this video useful, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe so you won't miss any of our daily uploads. And now, go ahead and explore some of our top recommended videos popping up on your screen. Goodbye, and see you in the next one.